So in this session, yeah, we're going to be thinking about our handbook, which is basically the Forest School Handbook is a collection of policies and procedures that is, um, describes how you operate your forest school programme. Um, so before we get into what's in, the, uh, in this handbook, I'd like us just to think about why. Why might we need a collection of policies and procedures? Um, why? So everyone's following the same. Yeah, so it could be used as a tool for communication, absolutely. So most often if you've got volunteers or helpers, other staff, then sharing your handbook is an important part of the induction training process so that they, as you say, you're all kind of coming from the same place uh, in terms of attitudes. Commu communication. <laughs> Yes, so, um, so safety is a, a big part of the handbook. So um, we refer to a variety of different, I guess, legal requirements. Um, and yeah, the Health and Safety Act is the biggest part, if you like, of the handbook. There are some other things that might be in there, like safeguarding and equal opportunities and things like that as well. But yeah, um, safety is, is a big part. So, but I'm going to put that under legal requirements. Mm -hmm. I'll pop that in there with that one, yeah? Safe. Safeguarding. Any other thoughts on why it's a good... Maybe know what to do if something arises. Like, you know what to follow, you know those steps if something bad was to happen. Or if you were unsure, yeah. you could check that, and if you then someone else come in, to help you and they don't actually they could then check that. So it's mm -hmm. sort of communication. Yeah, so it's um, uh, like pr protection from litigation, potentially. Um, so your own protection. So I guess there's two parts to what you've just said to Jamie. Like, so protection from litigation. So if, dread to think that if something was to happen, an accident or something happened at your forest school, one of the first things that they're going to ask you for is going to be your risk assessments, your policies and procedures. So, you know, if you've got that there, then that could uh, help in terms of, of, of litigation or, you know, exploring was it a genuine accident or was somebody at fault? There's another side to that, which I, um, I, I would also say is more important in many ways than protection from litigation, but peace of mind, yeah? So the idea behind your, your policies and procedures is that you think through, why am I doing this? How am I doing this? You know, what's the best way of doing this with the group that I'm working with? And so you've kind of thought through all eventualities before you're there actually in front of a group in, a, in the woods so that you've got that peace of mind that you've got that. Um, yeah, you've, had, you've got a checklist. And it, it, I, I found that, you know, having all of this in place enables you to go out there with confidence, you know, that you know what you're doing, you've thought about X, Y and Z and yeah. And, and that confidence and peace of mind leads to an air of professionalism as well. So, you know, often people don't realise perhaps the amount of work that goes into being a forest school practitioner and you know they think you basically just rock up and play with the kids in the woods and then you know when you're talking to them before you start a program you know say you're working with a, a school or a youth group or something and you say oh here's my handbook this explains what I do and how I do it they can be often really surprised because it, you know wow you've obviously put a lot of work in and it shows that you've really thought about what you're doing so I, I'd also say it kind of gives us uh, Fair, I can't spell professionalism, something like that. <laughs> I think I've put too many F's and S's and it's a new creative way of spelling that says professionalism. <laughs> um, uh, cool. I don't think there was some shared piece of mind too because they trust your procedures and they're like, 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so that like leads us on to a kind of few other um, parts to this. So, so that's kind of like the why. But then, in, t in terms of sort of like the what, what it is, what the what the forest school is, you know, the forest school handbook, uh, the what is so as you say, it evolves. It is. It should be a working document. So. As your practice grows and develops, and maybe you work with different age group, different needs, um, then then it, it should be a working document that continually evolves with your practice. So it, it evolves, um, and it needs to be kind of specific to to you. So like how I run Forest School is going to be different to how you run Forest School. So it needs your, your handbook should. Your handbook basically should be like a written description of what you do and how you are with a group. So it, so it needs to be specific to your practice. And, you know, you've got, you're going to have a different site, different situation. There might be patterns and there's certainly similarities in terms of what's included in a handbook, but the details should be specific. Um, I'd also mention here that it needs to be realistic. So sometimes I think, really, really stick. Sometimes when it comes to like the paperwork side of things, we can sometimes be tempted to look to an authority to tell us how it should be or how it is. And certainly there probably are lots of forest school handbooks of people shared on the internet. And historically there's been issues of kind of students downloading those and just kind of taking them in their entirety. But I would suggest, I mean, by all means, have a look at other people's handbooks to get like an idea, get a feel for what it's like. But, but do write your own rather than just cutting and pasting because it needs to be realistic and achievable for your situation. And in many ways, if, if you've written down something that isn't realistic and then you don't actually do it in practice, that could be worse for you should there be an accident than not having anything written down at all. So, so, you know, say there was an accident, you were investigated and it says you would do X, Y and Z in this procedure and you, you don't do that because it's not specific to you or it's not realistic for you, they could, they could find fault there. Whereas if you didn't have anything written down, you, you know, you could say just it was, you weren't aware of it, if you see what I mean. So do be very mindful that it needs to be something that you can put in place. Um, because we're all coming from different kind of places and backgrounds as well, just to mention that, so if you're in a workplace, there is already going to be policies and procedures within your workplace. There's already going to be like a health and safety policy procedure. There's going to be, uh, you know, risk management stuff, safeguarding stuff, equal ops. So if you're already in a school or organisation, the first step to this will be investigating what is already there. However, if you're the first person in your organisation to train as a forest school leader, there's going to be gaps in those policies and procedures and there's going to be a need to outline how you apply, say, the health and safety policy of the school in a forest school context. So, um, so, you, so you may be kind of working and referencing existing documents if you're a freelancer then it's good because you get to write your own from scratch um, which can be I mean okay is perhaps more work than updating or looking at other people's documents but it can be really nice because you have full control over what goes into it you don't have to necessarily have the discussions and the battles to change certain things because if you are working in a school, there might be certain things that work against the school policy. Like my, so one clear example that I had to deal with when I was teaching is the behaviour policy. So the school I taught at, the behaviour policy was based on sanctions and rewards. And of course, at Forest School, we want to work in a non-judgmental ethos. 
So I had to take the steps. So I had to meet with governors to actually talk about why we would be working outside of the school's behaviour policy when we were at forest school. Um, and, you know, I'd had to like, write a forest school behaviour policy that had to be then approved and signed off by the head teacher. So there might be cases, even if you've already got existing documents, they might not be fit for purpose for the forest school context. So you might have to either make amendments or changes or uh, additions. Um, if you're working in an organisation that's already got forest school leaders, you may already have a handbook that, that exists. Um, and if that's the case, then in terms of the qualification, what we would like you to do is to take the opportunity to update it, to review and update it and add to it, because we have to see your contributions to creating the handbook rather than kind of go, oh, my school's already got one, here you go, kind of thing. So, um, but it can, it can be, if you are working in a team of forest school leaders, it can be collaborative. And that makes sense, yeah? You've got a team of people working together. You want everybody's input. So that it can be, like, you know, working from the same page and consistent. Um, I mean, in terms of how it's presented, as in the actual details of what it looks like, that can vary from one setting to another. So it's entirely up to you how you actually want to put it together you know some people have it in a ring binder other people have kind of got an online version some people you know share bits of their handbook with parents or or with other other people um so however it looks it doesn't matter how it looks it just matters that you've got kind of the content I also just highlight at this stage, we've been talking about policies and procedures. So just to kind of separate that out in terms of what we, what we mean and what the difference is. So a policy is the why, yeah? So the why you do certain things. So for example, if you're writing your risk management policy, and what, in terms of the Forest School Handbook, it could just be like a few sentences for, for, the, for your policy often. Um, it doesn't have to be a massively long thing, but it's, it's the why. So, so take it, Take the risk management. That might explain our value judgments about there being um, important benefits by exposing people to appropriate levels of risk and our value judgments around what that right amount of risk is. That was all the why stuff. That would come into your policy. The procedures that would be associated with that policy is the, is the how. So then how do I go about putting that into place? So in order to manage risk and to get the right amount of risk, we use risk benefit assessments. We follow the health and safety execs five steps to risk assessments. We do seasonal site risk assessments, daily checks, activity risk assessments. And maybe if we're working with particular learners, there might be individual needs that get risk assessed. So, you know, that's the actual details of how I then go about it. Um, so just to separate that out. So there often is policies and procedures to together, if that makes sense. Another element to this is it needs to be useful as well. Like, so think of it, I, I found, when I did my forest school training, I found this bit really empowering because it was like, it's where I was making the decisions about my practice. So, you know, it should be seen as a, yes, we get to write our policies and procedures as opposed to, we get to write our policies and procedures. But, you know, <laughs> wherever you are on that spectrum. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's having this stuff and thinking through that enables us to go out and do the risky stuff, the more risky stuff with the kids and the play-based stuff with the kids. If we haven't gone through this thinking, we could be considered neglectful potentially. So, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to just look at kind of the legal requirements as a framework to kind of put into perspective what we need to include. Now, the, the bulk of what's in the handbook is actually based in health and safety law. Um, so we'll kind of do some thinking on that and then look at a few others but the bulk of it is health and safety um, uh, and the way I like to look at this is there are different elements that by law you have to put in place if you're an, if you're an employer it's the, the way it's 
framed in the law is an employer has to make sure that these are, are in place. Obviously, you're, unless you're freelance, going to be employees, so it's kind of what you would expect your employer to have in place for you. But I also like to see it as you could put yourself as the forest school leader in the role of the employer and your learners in the role of the employees. That's not how it is, legally speaking, but I like to see it like that because it's like, well, what do I need to provide for my forest school practice? Um, and also, as an employee of your workplace, you've been sent on this level three training. So presumably, unless you've got other level threes in your workplace, you're now going to be the expert in forest school. Um, so I guess the, 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 the decision making around forest school is kind of being disseminated to you, being delegated to you by having this training. Um, so we've already mentioned risk, risk management. Yeah, that, so that's part of, um, of health and safety law. So you usually would have a risk management policy and procedure in there. Um, from that, it might be appropriate to have some additional procedures around higher risk things. And there is at least well, two out there. There's four things that I consider very high risk that we might do in forest school. And I'd suggest you have at least two, two of these. Uh, but um, working at height. So if you're going to do things like tree climbing, rope swings, rope bridges, that kind of thing. So I would suggest that you had something, something, uh, bless you. Um, so if you're doing those things, you might as I said, your, your handbook's going to be unique to you, so it does depend on whether that's going to be an option in your forest school. But if you are doing things like that, then you would want the procedures around, around tree climbing, swings, that kind of thing. Uh, fire, I'd say in there. So if you're doing campfires, storm kettles, that sort of thing, uh, uh, procedures around fire. Of course, we covered all of that sort of like last, last time. So something to mention is as well, you can... We talked about risk assessments in previous modules. So you can cross-reference your risk assessments to your policies and procedures and vice versa. So, um, you know, they, they do correspond with each other. Uh, then tools. So I'm pretty certain that most people here are going to need fire and tools in, in, their, in their policies. The other high-risk one I consider is foraging. Because... Obviously, if you get that wrong, that can have serious effects. But again, that might not be something that you're doing. So it, it does depend on what you're doing. Um, so there's those aspects. In fact, I'll ask you, do you know what else is covered in health and safety law? Well, what other elements are there that employers have to provide? Rather than me just talking. It's like a quiz, health and safety law. Yeah, so uh, that's right. PPE is... Ooh, 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 ooh. Ooh, let's go wonky. Uh, yeah, you're right. P personal protective equipment is under, under health and safety law. So um, I would also suggest to extend this in terms of looking at this from a, from a school perspective, but thinking about clothing and appropriate clothing. So for your learners appropriate outdoor clothing for all seasons is going to be kind of your main item of PPE, if you like. So you need to think about how um, you give guidance to, to families, to parents as to how to dress their children, or maybe you're going to have to work with your workplace to make sure that you've got spare sets of clothing uh, to provide if, if the children won't be able to be kitted out themselves. And footwear as, as well, of course. Um, and it, there may be occasions where there might be other required PPE, depending on what you're doing. So we've kind of, I think Steph talked you through a few examples of, of PPE, but things that often get used at Forest School are things like if you have to walk along a road, there might be high-vis vests. Um, if you're um, handling 
hot things, the, the heat proof gloves, potentially if you're doing a lot of cooking and handling things there. Uh, there might be other like rigger gloves, work gloves, if you're handling thorny or stinging materials. Um, we're going to use some safety boots this afternoon when we cut down the trees and some hard hats um, uh, later as well. But I would say those are pieces of equipment that wouldn't get used with younger children. But I have used, you know, if you're working with teenagers and you're doing a lot of conservation work, the steel, steel toe caps and the hard hats might get used. But they might be also, as well as thinking about the children, you might also think about your adult helpers. So say the children aren't cutting down the tree, but your, your other helpers are cutting down the trees to get the wood for the materials that you need. So think about it as well as helping your, helping your staff, helping your or volunteers. It's worth knowing, just as you, as if you are an employee of somewhere, because PPE is part of the health and safety law, your employer should buy you it. And like, you could extend that to outdoor clothing. So like, if your school is telling you that you're going to be running forest school, and you've got to be out all year round, they should technically provide you with outdoor you know, waterproofs and weather gear. In fact, like, I only mention it because it doesn't often happen in schools. But like, if, you, if you work... In like you know for a country park if you're like when I was working as a ranger day one you get all your you know waterproofs outdoor kit wellies you, you know because it's part of health and safety law if you're going to work outside um so out of child ratios I would say is probably more under the risk because your ratio is like a an outcome of your risk assessment process. But it, it does fit in in terms of, I've, I'll just put it there because it's linked to this one. Tr giving training, adequate training and supervision is how it's worded in health and safety law. So um, it kind of yeah, ties in with risk management and that element. So training and supervision. So again, that kind of works in two ways. Your employer have sent you on this training because level three is the appropriate training level to run forest school. But then also you need to ensure that your children are trained, as it were, to stay safe, particularly with these sorts of things. Like as in we would teach them how to use a knife. Um, and as you say, the ratios would be the, 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 the appropriate level of supervision. Yes, that, yeah, that would be, yeah. So, um, yeah. Main maintenance. Maintenance of kit, yeah. So, that, yeah, that would kind of link, well, it links to PPE and it also links to your, particularly your tools and stuff. So that might, in, in terms of your handbook, you might mention that when you do your tool policies and procedures and your PPE. But yeah, having systems of being able to check that things are fit for purpose. Um, oh, and that one, actually, because your ropes as well. And the environment as well, like there aren't any sort of trees that look like they're going to sort of... Mm. Branches going to fall off. Like uh, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, that would come... That, so that, that would also link to your risk assessments... Yeah. Could you look for first aid? Yeah. There's some appropriate qualifications, but also having the right equipment. Making sure anyone else who comes out with you is also first aid trained, or making sure there's at least one. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So yeah, first aid is so. As I understand it, it's described as providing adequate and appropriate first aid. Is kind of how it's worded legally. So you need to make sure that you've got first aid, first aid qualification. So we strongly recommend that it's an outdoor first aid qualification because the outdoor courses cover scenarios, whereas the normal kind of first aid at work and stuff doesn't. They, they assume that you're indoors in an urban area so the ambulances can get to you within a certain time, whereas the outdoor ones cover 
things that you might need to know if you have to look after a casualty for a bit longer, which is why it's more uh, appropriate. So you will need like, yeah, your qualifications, as you say, the kit, um, which the big red rucksack, Alan, is our emergency bag, um, which will get out what we carry so you can have a look at kind of the things that we carry. Um, and usually on the first aid training that they'll kind of go through different kit and equipment because it's obviously it's more than just a first aid kit that we need, might need to carry. And to some extent that depends on how remote your site is. So if, if I'm carrying far more than I need for this site because this is a fairly tame site. But because we work on lots of different sites, I've got stuff here for more remote operations, if you like, more, more remote living. Um, and basically, I'm too lazy to repack the bag every time, so I just keep it all in one bag. So, um, so yeah, there's the training and the kit. And I would recommend, so in terms of like your first aid procedures, when you outline these in your, in your handbook, I would suggest doing like a three, a three different kind of procedures. So first of all, there's like treatable first aid, as in someone's cut themselves, they need it washed and a plaster, you know, so something that you can deal with. Um, uh, treating, treat, treatable, I meant treatable. Yeah, so kind of treatable first aid. Then there's like the next level, which I call the walking wounded. So say someone's fallen out of a tree and you suspect they might have fractured their wrist or something like that. So something that, yeah, you can kind of help them support it, but they need to go for further help to have an X-ray. Um, but it's not life threatening, you know, it's like more of a minor injury kind of thing. So walking wounded. Um, And then there is like the emergency kind of first aid where you need help really quick um, and there is possible threat to life. So, um, you know, that would be in a dialing 999 kind of situation. So I would recommend that you think about those sort of three separately in terms of how that happens. Um, and as well as thinking about like the casualty think also about the rest of the group as well because you know if you're treating that person what's happening to the other 10 kids and how's that managed you know is there is there a means of communication immediately or do you need to send somebody to run to the nearest landline phone because you haven't got reception for your mobile you know there's all sorts of things there to think about depending on your site and situation um, there is also like also consider what if it's you that's the person that gets injured as well what happens then as well like have you got a deputy to kind of take over <coughs> and do they know where everything is in terms of the emergency procedures and linked to this is also like near miss as well so I would suggest having some sort of process of recording and reflecting on any near misses. So, you know, say your swing, ooh, say so, so your flip chart lands on your head. <laughs> um, so, you know, say, say your rope swing snaps and no one's hurt, but, you know, it could have been nasty because their head just misses a, a, a boulder or something, you know? Like, if it, whoa, that was lucky. Um, you know, so, so having a process to kind of learn from near misses and to review risk assessments uh, can be important. Because believe me, you will encounter near misses. I know I have several times. Um, I guess coming, so that's specifically about first aid, but linked to that, you've also got other um, um, sort of emergencies. So you could say like accidents and emergencies, but there are other things like, well, <coughs> what happens if you lose a child? <sighs> or they purposely run off, of course, depending on your learners. 
Some people might go, yeah, <laughs> depending on what child. <laughs> but, you know, having systems to, to, um, to, to be either preventing that from happening in the first place, but then if you do notice that you're missing one or two, you know, what, what then happens? Um, also, what if there are uninvited guests, you know, random people suddenly visit you, uh, you know, and p potentially are hostile, you know, what, hap what happens then? Uh, depending on your site, I'd also maybe stick in like dogs potentially as well. Like if you're in a very um, dog walking kind of area, and having kind of loose dogs running around can be a regular occurrence, which it might not be perceived as an emergency, but depending on the nature of the dog and the nature of the learners, it might cause the learners to freak out and then run, run off, or you know, a dog running through just as you're using a knife or something is, you know, it can be, it can cause problems potentially. Um, Okie dokie. Any other thoughts in terms of what is included in, in health and safety law? If you, there's welfare as well, welfare requirements. So welfare requirements include things like drinking water. You have to provide drinkable water for people hand washing and toileting. I would say also, I know we've mentioned clothing in PPE, but also clothing kind of fits under welfare because there's um, things about having certain temperature ranges and stuff. Um, so it kind of ties in with welfare as well. So some of these things might be really easy, like if you're in the corner of the school playing field, then all of these things are going to be in the, in the building. But if you're further away, then you might have to think about how you provide these things. Um, can you ask to provide something more to themselves, or do you have to provide yourself? Uh, no, you can, yeah, that can, be your, that can be your procedure, bring a drink, you know, water bottle. If you're, if you're asking people to provide things themselves, I would strongly recommend you always have spare stuff for people who either forget or don't bring it. Because in my experience, every single group will always have people who don't have the right gear or the right stuff. But, but yes, yeah, absolutely. You, so, you know, you could give a kit list to your participants of what, what to bring and a bottle of water could be amongst them. You have stuff, but you can't, can't count on it. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Any other thoughts? What have I forgotten? First aid, emergency kit, PPE. Something that links to this is also something around reporting and RIDOR. Um, which is the reporting of injuries, diseases and dangerous occurrence regulations. So by health and safety law, there are certain things that you have to report to the health and safety executive. There's a whole like, list of them on their website. But it, it's, it's um, based on oh, reporting of injuries, diseases and dangerous occurrences regulations. Um, and it's usually, you know, if there's been more severe injuries or um, like communicatable diseases and things like, like that. Um, and it's, it's not necessarily that you're going to get into trouble for it. It's more that they, they, part of the health and safety exec's role is to monitor accidents and things in workplaces so that they can provide better guidance and support to those industries. So it's like it's a data collection thing. Um, so this is why in schools you might have the red book system where you have to write, report accidents. So the red book is like the step before RIDOR. So in, in a workplace, it's likely that your manager would be the person to report things to health and safety exec if needed 
um, and you know you might have a whole chain of reporting before that point. If you're self-employed, again, everything falls on you as a self-employed person. Um, so you need to be aware of what you need to, to report. Um, yes, reporting, and then uh, there was one more thing. What was the other thing? Something we're going to talk about on Wednesday when we have our cookout is also you might need to consider things like food hygiene that, that ties into kind of welfare. But we will explore that more when we have our cookout um, and about how we can have good practices of food hygiene when we're out, out and about in the woods. In some ways it's easier outside than indoors in a kind of curious kind of way because we're not trying to keep food warm for long periods of time and stuff like that you know we just kind of kill it cook it eat it kind of um way of working but that's, that's something else um so that's kind of yeah a general overview of like health and safety law and things to think about in terms of what we need to um i guess decide on or explore in terms of our forest school then as i said i'll just mention a few other laws that we need to be aware of and think about having policies and procedures around so we've already said about safeguarding um has everyone here had safeguarding training like, like as in if you already work with children don't you so okay so um so you've already had training. Something to think about is if you've got volunteers, you might need to provide some little in-house training. This would be part of like an induction for volunteers so that they understand your processes. Um, if you're in a workplace, of course, you'll already have a policy and procedure on safeguarding, but, but you, you might need to think about how do you, if there is a disclosure at, at Forest School, which is much more likely than normal classroom practice. In my experience, even as a teacher, all of the disclosures I've ever heard have always been at Forest School because of the reduced stress environment, because of that trusting relationship that you know, you're becoming a significant person to them. They're pretty much always going to share information with you when you're out at Forest School. So I guess in terms of Forest School, I guess be prepared for that and have... You know, if you need to kind of, well, some schools have particular forms that you're meant to jot things down in, or at least have a notebook so that you can record a conversation in, and then you know, you be aware of who the safeguarding lead is to then take it to the next steps. Um, so yeah, so think about disclose your processes. This, of course, DBS, DBS checks and things again for your volunteers potentially as well um, yeah then moving on to sort of other other legal acts to consider you probably want something around like equal opportunities or like inclusion equal opportunities that kind of type thing um, and again, this is something that you're going to probably already have in workplaces. But think about then how do you apply what has been said in that policy to Forest School? Um, because it might be more complicated at Forest School. And um, I would suggest... So uh, according to my understanding of like law and legal stuff, everything boils down to reasonability, you know, taking reasonable steps in terms of health and safety or reasonable steps in terms of inclusiveness. Um, so, for example, if you had a wheelchair user and your forest school site isn't wheelchair accessible and you haven't got like an off-road wheelchair and you haven't got any money to buy an off-road wheelchair, then you know, there might be an option to use a different site or something like that, which is reasonable, but it's probably not reasonable, you know, to put in, you know, haven't got the money necessary to put in full wheelchair accessible paths to that woodland. 
it's just what I'm trying to say. Like that, that it, you've got to kind of come at things with reasonable thing, uh, re looking at things reasonably within the parameters that, that you've got. Um, and often this boils down to taking things on a case by case example. Um, and I would recommend here, like so often you hear stuff in equal ops policies and procedures about we believe that everybody should have equal access to blah 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 regardless of sex age gender blah blah, blah you know what's but then i've noticed in some schools they'll stop certain learners taking part in forest school in fact i think we had a conversation last module about well what happens if other staff pull them out of forest school so well You've just said that in your equal ops that everyone will have a chance of X, Y, and Z, but why is it, But they've been naughty so they can't come to forest school. Well, then you're in breach of your equal ops, you know. There may be reasons why that learner can't come for safety, for example. Maybe you haven't got the ratios to keep things safe if, for, for that learner. But if that's the case, then that needs to be kind of represented in your equal ops um, policy. Um, you know, that maybe there may be temporary exclusions to the programme when somebody's safety is at risk until you can manage that risk more effectively. But then that might need resources and it might need people, which may or may not be possible. So it's, it's, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Um, but yeah, I'm just highlighting that often people are in breach of their equal ops policy because they don't always include everybody. Um, which kind of leads on to, in terms of like behaviour, as we were sort of talking about behaviour. Or, I don't always call it behaviour, but, <laughs> but, you know, but, but that sort of thing. And as I said, that can be one that can be tricky in a school environment because you might want to put something different in place than the sanctions and rewards existing behaviour policy. Um, This can tie in a little bit with um, sometimes people choose to have like a, almost like a learning and development policy or a observation and assessment type policies. It's what, so it's about, it's about um, how, how they facilitate the child-led ethos and in their procedures it often outlines like ways that they might observe the learners or ways that they kind of assess it's assessment with a small a not assessment in the terms of like you know sitting your sat but assessment in terms of gauging where people are at with their skills and understanding and then planning for their next steps kind of assessment so but that's what they would write you know in their policy and procedure I guess it's kind of explaining like the ethos, if you like, the ethos of what happens at forest school. And actually, in terms of some forest school programmes, there may actually be like evaluative, evaluative reports being done or action research being done. I know pretty much every single, every single forest school programme I've ever run, that I've done some sort of evaluation, evaluation or action research because the school or the organization that's asked me to run the program requires it or the funding requires it you know so you know this is being funded because we want to improve the transitions of nursery children into reception so they need some evidence to prove that it was successful so you know within my policy and procedures i've got like you know my evaluative tools that i'll be kind of observing the children on if that makes sense no. But in my experience, every single forest school programme, you usually end up start with a pilot because people want to see evidence before they then continue it because it's quite a big investment to run all year round. So you usually start with like a half a term, a terms pilot. If you can provide evidence, I will jump. I, I don't believe in all this like evaluation really being necessary for something that's so obviously beneficial for people. But I will jump the hoops if it means that the kids are going to be then able to come out in the future. So you may be asked to do some of that. Next module, we will talk more about like planning and observation and, and things as well. So we'll cover that. What kind of tools do you use to do that then? Like, or is it just for your own observation? And 
It depends on what I'm doing. So if I'm doing like early years and it's relevant to what the funders or the powers of B want, you can use things like the Leuven scales of involvement and well-being. That's two that have been used particularly in early years, uh, which is like a five-point scale. Um, there is, again, depending on what you're looking at, there are like scales for nature connectedness um, and nature connection. Um, there are also, like, so I've also, on certain projects, invented my own scales because of what they were targeted at. With one project, with Key Stage 2, I was using actually literacy scores as a comparative tool, uh, like before and after Forest School, because it, they had a particular literacy focus. Not that we were doing the literacy in Forest School, it was the literacy outside of Forest School and how the Forest School actually inspired their literacy. Um, uh, I've used... There's a tool that um, my friend developed that's called the PEM scale, which stands for Personal Emotional Motivation and Social... Um, and again, it's a five-point scale, which I tend to use with behaviour kids um, uh, that can show, you know, how they might change and develop. But yes, there's various ones that you can use. But it depends what your focus is or what, what, what the school wants, really. I've got some examples of them knocking around that I can dig out for you in a sec. Um, so we talk about scales equal ops. Um, we need to also think about things like um, uh, contingency and cancellation and that kind of thing potentially as well. So there might be times. Contingency, cancellation. So there might be times where for whatever reason you can't go out and run a forest school program um, as planned. Maybe it's to do with the weather, maybe it's to do with staff illness, so you haven't got the ratios. So you need something to explain, well, what happens instead if you've got a contingency or if you need to cancel it completely, what happens? Um, if you're a sort of a freelancer, you would also need sort of um, like terms and conditions, you know, like booking processes, terms and conditions, uh, client agreements, that sort of thing potentially as well. Um, it's probably not necessarily in, if you're already in a school. Um, what else we got? Uh, some people choose to include um, things around like... Ooh, like managing your sites, so sort of... Um, like sustainability, if you like, kind of. As part of the level three, you'll be doing your site survey and your sort of management plans anyway, but sometimes people choose to do that in a sort of a broader, a broader way. So as well as the actual woodlandy site bits, it's also to do with like procurement of kit and equipment and you know energy use and sort of the broader picture of sustainability um we are nearly there i'm sure is there anything else let me check my list do, do, do. Oh, environmental t's and c's we get as pretty much i'm gonna give you uh last one I would say is a, a, a essential one is about having some sort of daily operating procedures. So that's your checklist, basically. Operating procedures. So that, that's the one that's really useful in terms of sharing with your helpers and volunteers. So it's, it's Basically, you know, what do you do before, during and after a forest school session and who's responsible for what? So, you know, forest school leaders out doing the daily site uh, risk assessments. Somebody else is sorting out the brew kit, the water. Somebody else is, I don't know, making sure they've got the register. You know, who does what, when and how, basically. It's the daily operating procedures. Any questions about? Oh, 
I will just mention, actually, which is a slightly... Set, it's not to be necessarily included in your handbook, but um, something else to think about is to make sure you've got adequate insurance. I can't remember if we've mentioned insurance before, but, but um, you will need to make sure you've got adequate public liability insurance too. And even if you're in a school that will all, or organisation that's got insurance, I'd recommend checking whether that existing insurance covers you for the things that you will be doing at Forest School, like the fire lighting or the working at high at the tool use, that kind of thing. Do you need, um, I'm talking about church, we were talking about we don't currently use knives on site, so would we need something separate, like a separate insurance for that? Well, it's the reason you don't use knives because it's not covered in your insurance. Or we don't use. We in the forest garden we work with a couple of our children who use potato peelers. Ooh. Ooh. Um. So, so what was the so what's the background to it? Like what? Well, no, we've had the Forest School's fairly new, so I say, isn't it, to, to the school, and I suppose up until now, because the Forest School leader is trying to do a million and one other jobs, there's only certain things that we probably put in place. So it's more of just, it's a judgment of the existing Forest School provision, as in, it's not, yeah, okay. When I asked the exec about the other day, she said, yes, it's fine, we can have them, but do we need anything else? Okay. So you'd have to ask, your, yeah, basically check with your insurance that you're covered. Okay. It's not really the insurance, isn't it? If you do, like, food tech and things like that, that all covers that sort of thing anyway. My understanding, mean, it might have changed because it's been a long time since I was in schools, but if you're a county council school rather than an academy or anything, the insurance policy for Norfolk County Council covers you for anything within school hours as long as it's being led by county staff. So uh, the ultimate like responsibility lies with, I guess, the head teacher um, to make sure obviously everything is in place. It would be different if it was an after school club or if it was being run by a volunteer or somebody who wasn't employed by county. But it's been a long time since I was in school and, at, you know, check, so it might have changed. And in terms of storage, have we got to leave these stores in a certain way? You need to, part of your, your risk assessment would be, yeah, making sure that they are adequately, safely and securely stored. Okay. So, um, yeah, because there is, I mean, with knives as well, there is the knife law as well as just the health and safety law side of things. But, but that is only in effect if you're in public places. If you're on private land or like on school grounds, then the knife law wouldn't, because you're not carrying them in public, if you see what I mean. That's, you're kind of in a private situation. But if you're going down to the park or something, then you need to think about that too. Um, yeah. Cool. So, just a reminder, although it's kind of like, Whoa, there's a lot there that we've just kind of gone through, just a reminder, think of this as in liberating experience, that once you've kind of thought through this, you know, it can really help you feel like you own your forest school process. Um, and, you know, some of this is going to perhaps involve other people, managers and stuff in discussion, particularly if you're going to have to change anything um, or, or, you know, work outside existing uh, policies. Um, but yeah, think of it as empowering. It's this stuff that enables us to be out there helping the children learn and develop and embracing risk. Um, yeah. <laughs>